John Bunyan in in this combat no man can imagine unless he had seen and heard as I did what yelling and hideous roaring Apollyon made all the time of the fight. He spake like a dragon, and on the other side what sighs and groans burst from Christian's heart. I never saw him all the while giving so much as one pleasant look till he perceived he had wounded Apollyon. With his two-edged sword then indeed did he did smile and look upward. But twas the dreadfulest sight that ever I saw. So when the battle was over, Christian said, I will here give thanks to him that hath delivered me out of the mouth of the lion, to him that did help me against Apollyon. And so he did, saying, Great Beelzebub, the captain of this fiend, designed my ruin, therefore to this end. He sent him harnessed out, and he with rage, that hellish was, did fiercely me engage. But blessed Michael helped me, and I, by dint of sword, did quickly make him fly. Therefore to him let me give lasting praise, and thanks and bless his holy name always. Then came to him a hand with some of the leaves of the tree of life, the which Christian took and applied to the wounds that he had received in the battle. And was healed immediately. He also sat down in that place to eat bread, and to drink of that bottle that was given him a little before, so being refreshed. He addressed himself to his journey, with his sword drawn in his hand, for he said, I know not but some other enemy may be at hand. But he met with no other affront from Apollyon quite through this valley. Now the end of this valley was another, called the Valley of the Shadow of Death, and Christian must needs go through it, because the way to the celestial city lay through the midst of it. Now this valley is a very solitary place. The prophet Jeremiah thus describes it a wilderness, a land of deserts and of pits, a land of drought and of the shadow of death, a land that no man but a Christian passeth through, and where no man dwelt. Now here Christian was worse put to it than in his fight with Apollyon, as by the sequel you shall see. I saw then in my dream that when Christian was got to the borders of the shadow of death, there met him two men, children of them that brought up an evil report of the good land, making haste to go back, to whom Christian spake as follows. Whither are you going? Men. They said, Back, back, and would have you to do so too, if either life or peace is prized by you. Christian, why, what is the matter, said Christian? Men, matter, said they, we're going that way as you're going. And went as far as we durst. And indeed, we were almost past coming back, for had we gone a little farther, we had not been here to bring the news to thee. But what have you met with, said Christian? Why, we were almost in the valley of the shadow of death, but that by good hap 
we looked before us and saw the danger before we came to it. But what have you seen, said Christian? Seen? Why, the valley itself, which is as dark as pitch, we also saw there the hobgoblins, satyrs, and dragons of the pit. We heard also in that valley a continual howling and yelling as a people under unutterable misery who there sat bound in affliction and irons. Over that valley hangs the discouraging clouds of confusion. Death also doth always spread his wings over it. In a word, it is every whit dreadful, being utterly without order. Then said Christian, I perceive not yet by what you have said, but that this is my way to the desired haven. Men, be it thy way, we will not choose it for ours. So they parted, and Christian went on his way, but still with his sword drawn in his hand, for fear lest he should be assaulted. I saw then in my dream, so far as this valley reached, there was on the right hand a very deep ditch. Is it into which the blind have led the blind in all ages and have both there miserably miserably perished? Again, behold, on the left hand there was a very dangerous quag into which if even a good man falls he finds no bottom for his foot to stand on. Into that quag King David once did fall, and had, no doubt, therein been smothered, had not he that is able pluck him out. The pathway was here also exceeding narrow, and therefore good Christian was the more put to it. For when he saw it in the dark, to shun the ditch on the one hand, he was ready to tip over into the mire on the other. Also, when he fought to escape the mire, without great carefulness, he would be ready to fall into the ditch. Thus he went on, and I heard him here sigh bitterly, for besides the danger mentioned above, the pathway was here so dark that oft times when he lift up his foot to set forward, he knew not where or upon what he should set it next. About the midst of this valley I perceived the mouth of hell to be, and it stood also hard by the wayside. Now, thought Christian, what shall I do? And ever and anon the flame and smoke would come out in such abundance with sparks. the valley of the shadow of death. Sparks and hideous noises. Things that cared not for Christian sword, as did Apollyon before. That he was forced to put up his sword and betake himself to another weapon called all prayer. So he cried in my hearing, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Thus he went on a great while, yet still the flames would be reaching towards him. 
Also he heard doleful voices and rushings to and fro, so that sometimes he thought he should be torn in pieces or trodden down like mire in the streets. This frightful, sti- this frightful sight was seen and these dreadful noises were heard by him for several miles together. And coming to a place where he thought he heard a company of fiends coming forward to meet him, he stopped and began to muse what he had best to do. <coughs> Sometimes he had half a thought to go back. Then again he thought he might be halfway through the valley. He remembered also how he had already vanquished many a danger. And the danger of going back might be much more than for to go forward, so he resolved to go on. Yet the fiends seemed to come nearer and nearer, but when they were come even almost at him, he cried out with the most vehement voice, I will walk in the strength of the Lord God. So they gave back and came no farther. One thing I would not let slip. I took notice that now poor Christian was so confounded that he did not know his own voice. And thus I perceived, just when he was come over against the mouth, the mouth of the burning pit, one of the wicked ones got behind him and stepped up softly to him and whisperingly suggested many grievous blasphemies to him, which he verily thought had proceeded from his own mind. This put Christian more to it than any other thing that he met with before even to think that he should now blaspheme him that he loved so much before. Yet could he have helped it, he would not have done it. But he had not the discretion neither to stop his ears, nor to know from whence those blasphemies came. (coughs) When, When Christian had traveled in this disconsolate condition, Some considerable time he thought he heard the voice of a man as going before him, saying, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no ill, for thou art with me. Then was he glad, and and that for these reasons. (coughs) First, because he gathered from thence that some who feared God were in this valley as well as himself. Secondly, for that he perceived God was with them, though in that dark and dismal state, and why not, thought he, with me, though by reason of the impediment that attends this place I cannot perceive it. Thirdly, For that he hoped, could he overtake them, to have company by and by. So he went on and called to him that was before, but he knew not what to answer, for that he also thought himself to be alone. And by and by the day broke. Then said Christian, he hath turned the shadow of death into the morning. Now, morning being come, he looked back, not out of desire to return, but to see by the light of the day what hazards he had gone through in the dark. So he saw more perfectly the ditch that was on the one hand and the quag that was on the other. Also, how narrow the way was which lay betwixt them both. Also now he saw the hobgoblins and satyrs and dragons of the pit, but all afar off, for after break of day they came not nigh. 
yet they were discovered to him according to that which is written. He discovereth deep things out of darkness, and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. <coughs> now was Christian much affected with the deliverance from all the dangers of his solitary way, which dangers, though he feared them more before, yet he saw them more clearly now, because the light of the day made them conspicuous to him. And about this time the sun was rising, and this was another mercy to Christian. For you must note that, though the first part of the valley of the shadow of death was dangerous, yet this second part, which he was yet to go, was, if, if possible, far more dangerous. For from this place where he now stood, even to the end of the valley, The way was all along set to full of snares, traps, gins and nets here, and so full of pits, pitfalls, deep holes, and shelvings down there, that had it now been dark, as it was when he came the first part of the way, had he had a thousand souls, they had in reason been cast away. But as I said, just now the sun was rising, then, said he, his candle shineth in my head, and by his lights I do go through darkness. In this light, therefore, he came to the end of the valley. Now I saw in my dream that at, at the end of this valley lay blood, bones, ashes, and mangled bodies of men, even of pilgrims that had gone this way formerly. And while I was musing what should be the reason, I espied before me, I espied a little before me, a cave. Where two giants, Pope and Pagan, dwelt in old time, by whose power and tyranny the men whose bones, blood, and ashes lay there were cruelly put to death. But by this place Christian went without much danger, whereat I somewhat wondered. But I have learned since that Pagan had been dead many a day, and as for the other, though he be yet alive, he is yet by reason of age and also of the many shrewd brushes that he met with in his younger days, grown so crazy and stiff in his joints, that he can now do little more than sit in his cave's mouth, grinning at pilgrims as they go by and biting his nails, because he, co he cannot come at them. So I saw that Christian went on his way. Yet at the sight of the old man that sat in the mouth of the cave, he could not tell what to think, especially because he spake to him, though he could not go after him, saying, You will never mend, till more of you be burned. But he held his peace and set a good face to it. No, and set a good face on a good face on it, and then so went by, and catched no hurt. Then sang Christian, O world of wonders, I can say no less, that I should be preserved in that distress, that I have met with here, O blessed be, that hand that from it hath delivered me, dangers in darkness, devils, hell, and sin, did compass me while I this veil was in. Yea, snares and pits and traps and nets did lie, my path about that worthless silly eye. 
might have been catched and tangled and cast down. But since I live, let Jesus wear the crown. Now as Christian went on his way, he came to a little ascent, which was cast up on purpose that pilgrims might see before them. Up there, before Christian went, and looking forward, he saw faithful before him upon his journey. Then said Christian aloud, Ho, ho! So, ho! Stay, and I will be your companion. At that, faithful looked behind him, to whom Christian called again, Stay, stay, till I come up to you. But Faithful answered, No, I am upon my life, and the avenger of blood is behind me. At this Christian was somewhat moved, and putting all his, to all his strength, he quickly got up with Faithful, and did also overrun him, so the last was first. Then did Christian vaingloriously smile, because he had gotten the start of his brother. But not taking good heed to his feet, he suddenly stumbled and fell, and could not rise again until Faithful came up to help him. Then I saw in my dream they went very lovingly on together, and had sweet discourse of all things that had happened to them in their pilgrimage, and thus Christian began. My honored and well-beloved brother Faithful, I am glad that I have overtaken you, and that God had so tempered our spirits that we can walk as companions in this so pleasant a path. Faithful, I had thought, dear friend, to have had your company quite from our town, but you did get the start of me, wherefore I was forced to come thus much of the way alone. Christian, how long did you stay in the city of destruction before you set out after me on your pilgrimage? Faithful, till I could stay no longer. For there was great talk presently after you were gone out that our city would, in a short time, with fire from heaven, be burned down to the ground. <coughs> Christian, what? Did your neighbors talk so? Faithfully, yes, it was for a while in everybody's mouth. Christian, what? And did no more of them but you come out to escape the danger? Faithful, though there was, as I said, a great talk thereabout, yet I do not think they did firmly believe it. For in the heat of the discourse, I heard some of them deridingly speak of you and of your desperate journey, for so they called this your pilgrimage. But I did believe, and do still, that the end of our city will be with fire and brimstone from above, and therefore I have made my escape. Christian, <clears throat> did you hear no talk of neighbor pliable? Faithful, yes, Christian, I heard that he followed you till he came to the slough of Despond, where, as some said, he fell in, but he would not be known to have so done but I am sure he was soundly bedaubed with that kind of dirt. Christian, and what said the neighbors to him? Faithful, he hath, since his going back, been had greatly in derision, and that among all sorts of people. Some do mock and despise him, and scarce will any set him on work. He is now seven times worse than if he had never gone out of the city.
But why should they be so set against him, since they also despise the way that he foretook, forsook, the way that he forsook? <laughs> Faithful. <coughs> oh, they say, hang him. He is a turncoat. He was not true to his profession. I think God has stirred up even his enemies to hiss at him and make him a proverb because he hath forsaken the way. Had you no talk with him before you came out? Faithful. I met him once in the streets, but he leered away on the other side as one ashamed of what he had done. So I spake not to him. Christian. Well, at my first setting out, I had hopes of that man. But now I fear he will perish in the overthrow of the city. For it has happened to him, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Faithful. They are my fears of him too, but who can hinder that which will be? Christian. Well, neighbor faithful, said Christian, let us leave him and talk of things that more immediately concern ourselves. Tell me now what you have met with in the way as you came, for I know you have met with some things, or else it may be writ for a wonder. Faithful. I escaped the slough that I perceived you fell into, and got up to the gate without that danger. Only I met with one whose name was Wanton, that had like to have done me a mischief. It was well you escaped her net. Joseph was hard put to it by her. And he escaped her as you did, but it had like to have cost him his life. But what did what did she do to you? You cannot think, fa uh, faithful said, you cannot think, but you know something. What a flattering tongue she had. She lay at me hard to turn aside with her, promising me all manner of content. Christian. Thank God you have escaped her. The abhorred of the Lord shall fall into into her ditch. The abhorred of the Lord shall fall into her ditch. Faithful. Nay, I know not whither I did wholly escape her or no. Christian. Why, I trow, you did not consent to her desires. Faithful. No, not to defile myself, for I remembered an old writing that I had seen which saith, Her steps take hold of hell. So I shut mine eyes, because I would not be bewitched with her looks. Then she railed on me, and I went my way. Christian. Did you meet with no other assault as you came? Faithful. When I came to the foot of the hill called Difficulty, I met with a very aged man who asked me what I was and whither bound. I told him that I was a pilgrim going to the celestial city. Then said the old man, Thou lookest like an honest fellow. With that wilt thou be consent to dwell with me for the wages that I shall give thee? Then I asked him his name, 
and where he dwelt. He said his name was Adam the first, and that he dwelt in the town. In the town of deceit. I asked them then what was his work, and what the wages that he would give. He told me his he told me that his work was many delights, and his wages that I should be his heir at last. I further asked him what house he kept and what other servants he had. So he told me that his house was maintained with all the dainties in the world, and that his servants were those of his own begetting. Then I asked how many children he had. He said that he had but three daughters, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life and that I should marry one of them if I would. Then I asked how long time he would have me live with him, and he told me as long as he lived himself.